good September so far. Weather has turned a little bit cooler. It's been comfortable, actually. All right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless this message today. I pray that you'd help me, Lord, to bring forth this message with clarity. And Lord, let it be directed by your Holy Spirit. I pray I would say only those things that would bring the honor and glory. Bless your people today. Bless the Sunday school kids and the teacher. I pray that they would get a blessing as well. Bless our whole church and help us, Lord, to just continue to be faithful. And for those that are in need of serious prayer today, lift them up before you. Not sure who all uh, needs prayer, but we just lift up those that do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, I was reading an MSN article uh, the other day about what verses don't mean. What verses don't mean. Uh, it's interesting because uh, I like to read various articles here and there. And sometimes when you see something like this, it's it, it sparks your curiosity because now you go on there and it, the first one was Philippians 4.13. And what verses don't mean. And I thought, now, what are they going to say? And there were like 10 different verses. And I think I got uh, seven here and I was able to pick from this list. I agreed with some of their explanations of it, but others I didn't. And it's sneaky because you read this article and I don't know who wrote it. I didn't get the name of the person, but as it'll say, this verse doesn't mean this. Now, to your average reader, you look at this and you think that these people are authorities. And to the average reader, you would look and say, well, I guess they're right. But yet, with these things, we have to be careful. And in the day and age that we live, news hits us from everywhere, doesn't it? And you can be connected 24-7 if you want to be. But be careful the sources you get it from. And make sure that what you're reading in the end, always lines up with this. And I guess this message is really pertinent for today because this is a word of caution that you can't always believe everything you read. And you need to make sure, again, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Does what you're reading or what you're into, does it line up with this? And again, this is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice right here. The King James Bible is our authority. What it says is what we believe. And we compare not this to everything else. We compare everything to this. Okay? So that's the way you want to walk through life. Remember what I taught in Sunday school. It's the word that nourishes us. I am the vine. Ye are the branches, the word, and I speak unto you. That's what nourishes us. That's what cleans us. That's what helps us. That's what gives our connection to Christ and our connection to the vine. Very, very, very important to understand. As we walk through life, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So in these articles, and I get a blessing out of them because it challenges me. And I want to see in what I'm teaching and where they're coming from, can I prove what I believe? And it goes along with a verse that's in the scripture that says, if any man asketh you a reason of the hope which is in you, of the hope that is in you, that we should be able to give an answer to every man, right? Give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, okay? Be able to give an answer able to give something where someone can say, yeah, that was a good answer. And the answer should come from the word of God. We should be studied enough to know, you know, I praise the Lord. I, the other day, somebody in the young person in the church come to me and they said, a friend of mine has been asking a lot of questions and I want to know what do I have to do to win them to Christ? Pastor, what would you say? And I praise the Lord. I praise the Lord for young people like that, that want to know. And if you've been saved for any amount of time, you ought to know what to say to someone to win them to Christ, at least to win them to Christ. You ought to be able to open up your Bible or quote the verses to them, to walk them right down the plan of salvation 
right up the path to Calvary and show them the bloody Savior who died for them, but he didn't stay on the cross. The Savior that went to the grave and the Savior that three days after rose from the dead. This is your hope. and This is what you need to do to have eternal life. If you've been saved for any amount of time, everybody in here should be able to walk someone down that path. And if you haven't and you, you don't know how to do it, take a simple gospel track, God's simple plan of salvation. Read it and see what course they take in order to get somebody saved. So again, know your Bible. And that's the extent of this message today. Know your Bible and don't be deceived just because somebody says it. It's not always truth. And again, I'm going to go through seven of these today if I got the Lord grants me some time. The first one, verses that don't mean all that they say. Philippians 4.13. So if you're, I've sparked your curiosity, hopefully you'll get a blessing out of this. And again, for those who just walked in, this was from an article I read on msn.com. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4. Believe me, I look everywhere for sermons. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. Okay, so do we all know it? Come on, who knows it? Who's got it committed to memory? Put your hand nice and high. I got it committed to memory. Okay, we should all know this one. This is a life verse for many of you. Who's life verse? All right. It was Anna's. She's on to other verses now. <laughs> kind of like me. I switch here and there. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, if I just gave you that and we closed in prayer, wouldn't it have been a great sermon? It absolutely would have. And you say, amen, pastor, I need, I want to go home. Man. That's good. You gave me everything I needed right there. Amen. I told you one of these days I want to do it. One of these days I want to do it. Everybody's going to say, oh, I got out of church early. Like, wow, I kind of feel lost. What do I do now? Hey, where do we go? What do we do? See, got you prepared, okay? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, the article said, but it doesn't mean, okay, it doesn't mean we can do what we want. It doesn't make us Superman. Okay? Who agrees with that? And I read it, and I said, amen. Amen. Just because it says I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, it doesn't mean that we can do anything. Not that we're supermen. So what does it mean? So what does it mean? I can do all things. What's that all things? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Does that mean you can climb Mount Everest with suction cups? Or I mean with, uh, or climb the Empire State Building at Mount Everest. That'd be interesting with suction cups, but some people just can't do that. But I can do that through Christ. Is that what that means? I can fall from the Empire State Building and bounce off the ground and stand up? No, if you do that, you're going to be smashed. And it's a myth if you drop a penny from the Empire State Building and hit somebody in the head, it'll go through their skull and all the way down to their chest. Who's heard that? It's a myth. It won't, it won't kill us. <laughs> we all believe that growing up, but I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So what's the all things? Okay, now looking at and keeping it in perspective, all things we can overcome past events that haunt us. Don't some of our past sins creep up in our life and give us grief? Some of the things we've done Okay. How about present distresses? Anybody having a present distress that you're having a hard time getting through? Larry gave testimony this morning about his migraines for 30 straight days. I'm sure he relied on the power of God to help him get through and said, Lord, I need your strength and your grace to get through this. Could he have quoted the verse? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Would that have been applicable for that? Absolutely, it would have. Absolutely. We talked about your distress in the past and how Donnie went through some things. And if you have an infirmity right now or an affliction or a trial or a tribulation that you're going through, 
The Lord wants you to say and think, I can do this. I can make it through this, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's what that's all about. And this applies to future things as well. Our attitude moving forward, no matter what it is that happens in my life, I can do it and I can get through it through Christ. That's what that verse means. So him saying, or whoever wrote this article, I'm going to assume it's a God. It doesn't mean I can be Superman, but it does mean that no matter what comes in my life or no matter what's in my life through the power of Christ, I can overcome it. Okay. And I got a blessing out of that. It kind of, it kind of helped me to put together a little sermon to say, okay, that's a good first point. Now the second one, John 14, 14, John 14, 14. I'm going to focus on these first three being our petitions or requests to God or our relationship with God. Uh, John 14, I, I tried to put them in, in an order that I wanted. John 14, 14 says this. If ye shall ask anything in my name, John 14, 14. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And his comment was, this doesn't teach that God will give us everything we want. And that's the truth. It doesn't teach that God's going to give us everything we want. We could go to God and we can ask for something that just is outlandish or unreasonable or just ridiculous. And just because you request it doesn't mean God's going to give it to you. Again, I agree with him on this. But what does it mean? What does it mean? If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. We should pray and ask that what we're asking for is within the will of God. <clears throat> is it within the will of God? Lord, I need help with my future. I need help with direction. I need help with choosing a career. Lord, I need help with choosing a mate. Lord, we got a decision to make on this car, or we have a decision to make on this home. Do we purchase this? Lord, an opportunity has come up for me to move, and I really like my church, and I really like where I'm at, and my family's kind of settled, but the opportunity to move over here would pay me X amount of dollars more than I'm currently making and would give us a really nice living, Lord. Right? What is your will? Lord, help me. That's what that verse means. Ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that we he heareth us, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. You see, just because it says something doesn't mean we interpret and say that means anything. No, it doesn't. When we pray, we always want to pray in accordance with God's will. Because if God just gave us everything, what would that make us? What would it make us? Spoiled. And I know you don't give your kids everything they ask for. And I know that when you were a child, you didn't get everything you asked for. And of course, you older ones never got anything you asked for. <laughs> because every generation gets harder and harder, or easier and easier and easier for the ones that were before it. You know, of course, the older generations always walked up two, two miles uphill to school both ways. You know, it was always difficult on them. You kids nowadays, you get everything you asked for. And then the parents, the grandparents will look at the parents and say, why are you getting everything they asked for? You know, and then they turn around and say, because I got nothing I asked for, you know, so therefore they spoil their children. But because you give them everything and if God was that way and God gave you everything you asked for, you would be spoiled. We pray in accordance with God's will. God knows what's good for us. Come on. And God also knows what's not good for us. And that's why sometimes you wonder, why didn't that prayer get answered? Why didn't that request get answered? 
Maybe God thought it wasn't good for you. So just because it says, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it, that anything is not anything. It's anything in accordance with God's will. Okay. And also, God doesn't guarantee this next one either. Let's go to James chapter 5, point number 3. James chapter 5. This is right along the lines of asking for things. James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And let's look at verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. And I thank God I got a King James Bible. Because in the new translations it says confess your sins. If you don't believe me, go look. Confess your sins one to another. That's not what we're supposed to do. Confess your faults. When you wrong somebody, you go and you say, I'm sorry, that was my fault. Not you say, forgive me of my sins. Not about that. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Okay, it availeth much. This doesn't mean, and the man said in the article, this doesn't promise every prayer will get answered. It doesn't promise that. But the effectual fervent prayer has more of a chance of being answered. And this effectual fervent fervency pleases God. And this is what the verse is saying. When you pray, and you pray more effectual and fervently, with more of an increased desire and more of a, Lord, I need this prayer answered. Well, we could go to God and say, Lord, I need a prayer answered. And God might say, how willing are you to come to me to get this answered? And then you say, I need this answered. And in fact, Lord, I'm going to pray fervently over this. I'm going to start fasting over this. And I've been talking a lot about fasting. The Lord has laid it on my heart quite a bit lately to fast. Fasting is a way to get a hold of God. And I'll tell you, you don't like to afflict yourself and go without food. Nobody does. Nobody does. It's not easy. But when you go without food and you afflict yourself, you come before God, you say, Lord, I need this prayer answered. And I'm going to pray fervently and effectually about this. And go and say, I'm going to fast about this. I'm going to bring supplication. And I, Lord, I'm coming after you for this. Does God like that? That's the way to get your prayers answered. You want to be a prayer warrior, but come before God. And if you have to, afflict yourself through fasting. And God sees that. And maybe through it, even tears come. And tears are a language that God understands. It comes. Lord, I'm broken over this. I need help. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Okay, now here's another one he said. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now this is going to go away from the request to God. This is going to go to a different subject. And subject today that I don't know how people get around it, but this is what he said. 1 Corinthians 14, and let's look in verse 34. We're going to look at two verses. And then he said, this doesn't teach. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obeisance, obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. And after reading that, and he had the verse there, I said, now what is he going to say? And he said, this doesn't teach that women can't preach. What are they supposed to do, hand motions? What's it say? What's it say? You see, we have to see what it says. And we have to compare the scripture to itself to understand 
Should they or shouldn't they? They're commanded to be in silence. Now, in the day and age we live, any preaching against a woman preaching is unpopular. But it's not my opinion, is it? Because emotionally, I can bend and break. And I can say, well, we can work around that. That's not how it works. Let God be true. And every man a liar. This is not the word of Kevin, is it? Whose word is it? And shouldn't we do what God says? What does God say? Now, how do we prove things? How do we prove it? Do we just pick it out and say, that's not what that teaches? Because I want to be in line with everybody else in the world right now. And I don't want anybody to throw barbs back at me because I understand you ladies. No, and this is an anti-woman. It's not about that. It's about what saith the Lord. Because all of us have roles and all of us have responsibilities. And those roles and responsibilities must line up with the word of God or God will not bless it. Okay, so how do we prove it? Well, we take scripture with scripture and we prove the points by not just throwing one verse out there, but saying, what saith the word? What does the whole counsel of God say? Okay, let's have a look. Now he cites in the article, Miriam. He says, Miriam was a prophetess. Okay, he says Deborah was a prophetess and Phoebe was a deaconess. Ah, there's the red flag. Is the word deaconess found in the Bible? Now, I went and looked up Phoebe and I went and studied Phoebe. Phoebe ministered to Paul and ministered to the churches. She was basically the brains behind the operation for the churches. Okay. She ministered through the churches and was like a church treasurer and secretary. She kept everything organized. She wanted all of those responsibilities of the churches to run through her. She organized everybody. Now, biblically speaking, that's a great responsibility. But it never says she got up and preached in front of people. Miriam never mounted a pulpit. And Deborah never mounted a pulpit either. And in fact, they were not part of the church at all, were they? So the rules applying to the Old Testament, we know that some of them to the new definitely changed, didn't they? Now, what else does Paul say? Okay, let's go to let's go to two things here. Let's go and understand this. Why were women created? Let's ask ourselves, why was the man created? Why was the man created? God created Adam. And Adam communicated with God. And then what happened? Adam got lonely. And God said, you need to help me. And God provided a woman for Adam, his wife. And his wife was a help meet to him. What does it help me? And if you go back to the Garden of Eden, the New Testament sheds light on actually what happened there in the garden. The reason women don't belong in pulpits is for one, they're not even the head of their home, let alone be the head of a church over men that are not their husbands. And the reason they said what it says here in Corinthians is because when a woman had a question, she was supposed to go back home to her husband, who was her head, to ask her or ask him what it meant. Got to be careful with swapping roles when God doesn't bless that and God doesn't ordain that. And that's what's happening in the world today. The roles are being switched. And I've told you so many times, men are now on advertisements with 
all kinds of laundry detergents and everything else and things that when I was a kid, these men would never have been in these commercials. When you see commercials, you got the woman driving the car, the man over here on this. I'm not saying if you do it that way, fine, but the roles are just swapping and switching. And women are getting put in positions of power all over the place. But the one place they don't belong is in a pulpit preaching to other men. They just don't belong there. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, she was made as a helpmate. And also it says over in the book of First Timothy, book of First Timothy, <clears throat> First Timothy chapter two. And it's not to say that a woman is less. It's not what this is about. It's about the roles that God gave us in life. First Timothy chapter two in verse number nine. It says in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. With shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. <clears throat> and here's where it, first, it goes back to Genesis. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Now, I had a brother call me the other day and say that in in his church and he had a problem with this he said i just want to get your opinion on something in our church and i'm not going to tell you where it is it's not around here but he said in our church he said the pastor's wife will get the women aside and teach them and he was all distraught and upset about that and he bounced that off of me and he said what's your opinion on that and i could tell he wanted me to be very negative on that and I said, brother, I don't have a problem with that. He said, oh, but, but, but I said, I don't have a problem with that. I said, she is taking the other women and teaching the women. I said, as long as her husband, the pastor knows what she's teaching and has reviewed those notes, there is nothing at all wrong with that. And he expected me to say something different. She's in her place. She's amongst the other women teaching them. And taking care of that. It's the same with Sunday school. A Sunday school teacher being a female. No problem with that at all. In fact, I encourage that. But if anything ever happened to me, I would counsel you to never go against God's word and put a woman in this pulpit. Because God won't ordain that. And doesn't ordain that. And he doesn't approve of that. Now you say, well, what about all these other churches? Whatever they do, they do. We are responsible for God for what we do. And what the road to Emmaus Baptist Church does. And in the end, is what we're doing lining up with the word of God. That's the whole thing. Now, got real quiet and silent over that. And I know there are a lot of questions that may come of that. And again, you know me. I've been a pastor for a long, long time. And you women know I am not anti-woman. I am not. I love the women who have been ministering to me over the course of my life in the churches I've been. They've been so important in my life. Without them, I don't think I could have made it through. I don't. They have done incredible things to help support me in the ministry. And I appreciate it so much, as Paul did. As Paul did. He commended those women. And I commend you. I am not anti-women. And because I said this, I'm not an anti-woman. But when it comes to the pulpit, you just don't belong here over a bunch of men you don't belong in this pulpit and i disagreed with him on that particular point there now this next one <clears throat> this is a popular one around the world okay and i'm glad he mentioned it let's turn to matthew chapter 7 matthew chapter 7 that last one was a tough one <laughs> let's go to matthew chapter 7 matthew 7 <clears throat> and verse number one we should all be able to quote this one because the world quotes it all the time. And some say sarcastically, judge not as you be not judged. How many have heard that? Okay, so judge not that you be not judged. It doesn't mean, according to this man, it doesn't mean and doesn't tell us 
that we can't judge anyone ever. It doesn't say that you can't pass judgment on someone ever. Judge not that you be not judged. So what does it mean? What does it mean? And I agree with him. If you pass judgment on somebody and your judgment lines up with the word of God, it's okay to do that. It's all right to do that. But what is the problem? What's the whole problem? Why did Jesus say this? Why did he say, judge not that you be not judged? He was cautioning you. And the ones he was saying it to, be very careful. If you judge, what do you need to be sure of? That you're not doing the same thing. That's exactly what it means. So when somebody fires this back at you, say, that's not what that means. What it means is, don't judge if you are doing the same thing. Now, does the Lord clarify? Of course he does. Let's look at verse two. They only quote you the first verse. Judge not that you be not judged. And isn't it weird the ones who say that to you are the ones who already passed judgment on you? <laughs> And sometimes there's the worst culprits, aren't they? <clears throat> they judge you and you haven't even said a word. <clears throat> judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, <clears throat> ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now look what he says here in three. And why, <clears throat> and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? but considers not the beam that is on thine own eye. All right, so you say to your brother, hey, 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 Donnie, you got a splinter in your eye there, and let me help you get it out. And as you get closer to Donnie, you can't get closer because there's a beam hanging out of your own eye. <laughs> and the Lord says, uh, take the beam out of your own eye before you take the moat out of your brother's eye. You see? hypocritical let's keep going verse four or how wilt thou say to thy brother let me pull out the moat out of thine own eye and behold a beam is in thine own eye thou hypocrite first cast out the beam out of thine own eye and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye now this isn't the only chapter that i can go to to prove that let's go to romans 2 one of the most difficult chapters in the bible Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Let's go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And let's look in verse number 1. Romans chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest, doest the same things. There you go. That's just like Matthew chapter 7. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? So you got to be careful. Before you judge somebody else, you have to make sure that your own doorstep is clean and in life. And I'll tell you, as a pastor, you always have to be careful when you're in the pulpit, when you're preaching, that your own life is clean. And hey, as and any of you know, if I ask you to preach, before you get up here and preach, what are you doing all week long? What are you doing? You got the broom out, don't you? And you're sweeping away and you're saying, oh, I got to get that out of my life. I better stop. Lord, forgive me for that. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, D -d 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 -d, get that out, get that out. And you're, you're, you're uh, feverishly trying to get all that junk out of your life so that you can prepare yourself to get up here to preach God's word because be ye holy as I am holy. And you want to bring forth the word because if we're so full of garbage, the word will never go through us to come out the way it should. Got to make sure that our doorstep is clean. 
And I tell you, there have been times in my own life where sins have crept up in my in my heart or in my mind, or I've done something. And I say, Lord, I got to make sure I keep keep those things in check and make sure I get keep that right with you, and a- ask for forgiveness. And if need be, whatever you need to do, Lord, I'm sorry for maybe doing that or this or whatever. Romans chapter two, when you read the Bible and all of a sudden you see that it's like it hits you. And when it does, or if you're reading your Bible and it hits you, and you say, I have a hard time witnessing. What does Psalm 51 say? When David confessed his sins and got right with God, what'd he say? Then will I then will I teach sinners thy ways? Okay? And it says, sinners shall be converted unto thee. A lot of times you say, well, I'm not a powerful witness. What's in your life that's stopping it? Clean up the threshold of your own door and get the beam out, as he says, you'll be able to see cleaner and clear to be able to get the moat out of your brother's eye. Judge not that you be not judged. Deals with your heart and what's in here. Make sure this is right before you tell somebody else. Romans chapter two. That's what that means. That's what it means. Now, these last two, I disagree with. I disagree with. And this next one is very, very important to salvation. Very important. And anybody reading that article would think they could walk away without doing what God said. And this is so sly how the devil works. And through that, I'm sure many have read it. I bet hundreds of thousands of people read that article. And they came walking away saying, "Uh uh-huh, I knew it. I knew it. I can help God out. God doesn't need our help. Let's go. Where am I going? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And with the other hand, I'm going to ask you to get James. James chapter 2. And if I'm reading this as a Roman Catholic, I would smile. Because not all believe that you're saved by grace through faith. Some believe that you have to add a little bit of work to help God out. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the comment was, this doesn't teach we are saved by faith alone. That's exactly what it said. This doesn't teach that we are saved by grace, by faith alone. What does it say? And why would you pick this out and say it doesn't say that? Because the person who wrote it tried to back it up with James, which says, James chapter 2, James chapter 2, And look in verse 23, James chapter 2 and verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. And he said, see, it doesn't teach that we're saved by grace through faith alone. Okay, so what do we do? What do we do? What does it really teach? What does it teach? Okay, when we go to the book of James, we have to be very careful when we go to the book of James that we take doctrine out of James and apply it to us. Okay, because if you go to James 1, James 1, and look in verse number 1, are there any Jews present here today? Any Jews? uh, Everybody here Gentile? All hands everywhere, Gentile, right? 
So we got to be careful. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. Who was it written to? It was written to Jews. It was written to Jews. It's not a Pauline epistle. The 13 Pauline epistles contain what it takes for someone in the church age to get to heaven. In fact, I know that to be true because Paul, in the book of Galatians, actually rebukes the church at Galatia over them teaching that people could work their way to heaven. He comes down on them with a hammer and says, what are you doing? So the truth of the matter is, Galatians clears it all up. Let's go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. Now, why were they so foolish? Okay. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith. What's the controversy? The controversy is, how did you get the Spirit? Did you get it through faith? Or did you get it through works? Okay, now what happens when you get the Spirit? You get saved. When you're saved, you get the Spirit. You're born of the Spirit. So how do you get it? You don't get it by works. You get it by faith. And it's given by grace. That's what the Lord says. And he confirms it here in Galatians. In verse 3, are ye so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect through the flesh, by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You see the difference here? He's asking, do you get it by works or do you get it by faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham? Now let's go down there in verse number 11. It says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Through faith. Faith. So when it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Here's what the Lord wants. We set ourselves aside and our good works and everything we offer God. Lord, I can't make it. I'm coming to you with childlike faith. I can do nothing and I'm lost. By your grace and through the faith in your son, I want you to come into my heart and say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved no works god doesn't care we can't we can't offer him anything to help him save us in fact he doesn't want us to self-reformation will not work with god we come to god with childlike faith for by grace are you saved through faith and finally my last one this this is something the world is trying to get around us and through this article, he's trying to get around it. Whoever wrote it, I don't know. It says in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Anybody know the verse I'm going to go to? It is the commandments. 
Which is the one? It's not thou shalt not kill. It's that one right there. That one right there. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. This doesn't say we can't use God's name as a cuss word. This doesn't say, I, I was like, I read, I said, oh, man, trying to get, and I know other people have been approaching me about this and saying, because I've said to them, you know, the Lord says, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. He won't hold you guiltless. Yeah, but that doesn't mean cuss words. Who's heard it? It's a popular teaching nowadays. You can take the name of the Lord in vain and you not do really do it in vain by cussing. What it really means, and this is what the guy says, the article explains that this means not to use the phrase, here's the way you take it in vain. Well, God told me so. Or God instructed me. Or God said, when he really didn't tell you, and he really didn't say, now that's taking it in vain. Well, I say, amen, I agree with that. When you say, well, God said to do something and he didn't tell you, that would be taken in vain. Or God instructed me when he never said that, that would be taken in vain. But so would being used as a cuss word. I mean, you want to add a little bit to it? Let's add to it. Don't take away from it. Can I back up what I just said about scripture? Can I? Can I? Can I say that article's wrong on that point? Can I prove it by the Bible? Where? And my whole idea of this message is, and I'm going back to the beginning, be careful what you read and make sure what you're reading lines up with what you know. Because this is the devil's way of getting people off the beaten path. I'm not saying his article was of the devil. But there are little things in it that can twist the mind and heart of the true believer. If they're not exercised in what they believe. So can I prove that saying GD and other things that you shouldn't say. Or taking the name of Jesus Christ in vain. Can I prove that that is against the seventh or against the commandment here, the fourth commandment of taking the name of the Lord in vain. Okay. Third or fourth commandment. Third commandment. Yeah, it's a, it's the third commandment because the Sabbath is the fourth commandment. Okay. It's the third commandment. And let's go to Leviticus chapter 19, Leviticus chapter 19. <laughs> Nothing like a Bible to clear this up, huh? All right, this is my final point that will be dismissed in prayer. Leviticus 19. I hope I challenged you today. Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, verse 12. And ye shall not swear. Oh. Huh? Huh? They like to call I'm cussing. No, you're swearing. That's what we used to call it. You're swearing. That's a swear word. You shouldn't say that. You shall not swear by my name falsely. Neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. I think that verse cleans it up. <laughs> and again, nothing like a Bible to clean up an MSN article, huh? <laughs> About the Bible. Just be careful. Just be careful. All right, let's be dismissed in prayer. Let's have Brian. Will you please close this?